1.9 million civilians. Very good. Okay, Emma, tell me about North Vietnam. What, was the, what, were, the, what were the costs of war there? 1.1 million military. Right. And then 65,000 civilians. Okay, why was civilian count so low in North Vietnam? Because it was mostly fought Very good. Now, Hannah, do you remember this yesterday? Why was it virtually a war we could not win? What was the sacrifice on the part of the North Vietnamese that made the war we probably couldn't win? Because their population cycle was so extinct that they could have fought for 100 years and never ran out of That's right. Isn't that incredible when you think about that? They could have fought and fought and fought. And were, were Americans willing to lose more than we did? I mean, we were very upset over the 58,000 that we lost. So it was an unwinnable war. Okay, I'm going to give you some final thoughts on the Vietnam War. Got some final thoughts. One final thought that you need to realize was the Vietnam War was the first foreign war that the United States ever lost. It was the first foreign war that the United States ever lost. Another final thought on the Vietnam War was the incredible financial cost. It was estimated that it cost the United States of America $109.5 billion to fight the Vietnam War. That's in the 1960s and 70s. That's a lot of money today. So we spent a staggering $109.5 billion on the war. Remember, at one time it was costing us how much a day? million a day. <clears throat> Alright, how about American casualties? Here's another final thought. Here are the American casualties in the Vietnam War. 58,267 KIA. 58,267 KIA. What's that mean? Killed in action. This means that they were dead or the missing have been identified. Okay, those are KIA. Okay, wounded in action, WIA. 303,644. 303,644 wounded in action. And 1,711 MIA, missing in action, who still have not been identified. 1,711 MIA. So you have 58,267 KIA, 303,644 WIA, and 1,711 MIA. And as I mentioned to you in D.C. when we were in Arlington, the last American casualty in Vietnam was William Noldy from Michigan. William Noldy from Michigan was the last casualty of the Vietnam War. Here is a picture of William B. Noldy and an etching we did a year or so back. So there's the last casualty of the Vietnam War, William Noldy. We were honored enough to visit his gravesite in Arlington. Another final thought on the Vietnam War was the suffering that Vietnam veterans did long after the war. Depression, anger, those types of things. And I'm going to give you some examples of how they suffered. So the fourth final thought of the Vietnam War is the many Vietnam veterans who suffered long after the war. And here are some examples of their suffering. What do you think happened to some of these Vietnam veterans when they got home? Okay, well, let's, okay, we'll, we'll take that, we'll take that. We'll say mental problems. Right, they had post-traumatic stress syndrome from the war, or mental problems. There's one problem they had. What might be another problem they had? What's that? Well, we haven't got, that's going to be another thought. That's a good thing to keep. They suffered, this is more suffer, suffered mentally or physically, so to speak. So I'll, I'll give you the other one. Health problems. A lot of them had health problems. So mental problems and health problems. But we'll get to what Taylor said a little bit later. So they suffered mental problems, health problems. What else might you see in a Vietnam veteran problems they had? 
And drug and alcohol abuse, very good. Drug and alcohol abuse. Somebody else might have said something different. Did somebody say something different when we were talking? Say it. Physical disability? What's that? Economic. Um, uh, that, that's close, Levi. It actually is better than close. Joblessness and in, unemployment. So economics would make sense. So they suffered mental problems, health problems. They, they suffered drug and alcohol abuse, unemployment or joblessness. They couldn't get jobs. What else might they have done? Somebody might have said it, I didn't hear it. What else might they got themselves involved in because of their problems after the war? What else might have resulted in their problems? They come home, they're not in a very good mood, they're hard to get along with. Violent crimes. Violent crimes. If you're hard to get along with, what might that have resulted in in families? Divorce. High divorce rate. Okay? So here's some of the Examples of how veterans suffered. They had health problems, they had mental problems, they had unemployment problems, they committed violent crime, crimes, they suffered with drug and alcohol abuse, high divorce rate, and if some couldn't take it, what happened? Suicide. Very good, suicide. So those are just some examples of how Vietnam veterans suffered after the war because of their depression or anger or the way they felt about themselves. Now we're going to get to what Taylor said. It's another thought. Probably the most tragic thing about the Vietnam War was the lack of appreciation by the American people toward those soldiers that fought in Vietnam. Okay, it was an unpopular war. They came home. They were called baby killers. They were criticized. They weren't given that hero's welcome that they had gotten after the Korean War and after World War II, etc. So that was a tragic thing. And, the, and Vietnam veterans to this day are upset about the fact that the nation didn't recognize their efforts and sacrifices in the war. I've talked to several Vietnam veterans. I talked to Emery's grandfather for a long time at my house the other day. He's actually going to come in and speak a little bit one of these days about his experience as an MP in Vietnam. And he felt the same way. You know, they were fighting an unpopular war. Did they get a hero's welcome when they came home? No. Hell, they were losers. They lost. First foreign war we ever lost is how people felt. And that Vietnam War left such a bitter taste in the mouth, not only of all Americans, but also soldiers that fought in that war had a bitter taste in their mouth. And so it was really a bad thing in general. Well, because of the Vietnam War, this is kind of interesting, partly because in March of 1971, Congress adopted a new amendment to the Constitution. The 26th Amendment to the Constitution was adopted in March of 1971, even before the war was completely over. Anybody know what that amendment to the Constitution did? Anybody know? Give people 18 and over the right to vote. Right, it lowered the voting age to 18 in both federal and state elections. And this was estimated it would give an additional 25 million young people across the United States to express their opinion on an election. So the 26th Amendment of the Constitution was passed in March of 1972, excuse me, 71. And it was a piece of legislation that lowered the voting age to 18 in both federal and state elections. And they estimated it would give probably 25 million more people, especially young people, obviously, the right to vote. What else was the philosophy behind lowering the voting age to 18? We're old enough to be drafted. You're darn right. If you're old enough to be drafted and serve your country at 18, you ought to be able to vote for the leaders that will or will not send you to war. So that was another big philosophy of this change. So if you're old enough to fight, you ought to be old enough to vote. And that wasn't the case, because what was the voting age prior to this amendment? 21. Okay? All right, that ends our Vietnam saga. I do want to leave you with this last statement. Lyndon Johnson took a lot of heat for the Vietnam War, and I've told you this before. But the majority of the names on that Vietnam wall occurred during Nixon's administration. There are more names on that wall as a result of Nixon's administration than Johnson's. Okay, that'll take us to the election of 1972, which is going to be the setup for what we know today as Watergate. The election of 1972. Now, at the Republican National Convention, it was a no-brainer. There was no drama. The Republicans nominated President Nixon for re-election and Vice President Agnew for re-election. There was no drama whatsoever. Okay? It would be the Democratic convention in which they're going to have to try to find a quality candidate to replace 
the Republican presidency. Anybody want to guess who we've talked about already, didn't talk a lot about him, that might have been the Democratic nominee for president in 72? He kind of came in after the Kennedy, Robert Kennedy assassination. He was one of those fellows. What's that? Come from a pretty small populated state. Okay, they may remember who that guy was that came from South Dakota. We talked about a couple days ago. George McGovern, very good. So again, the Democrats choose Senator George McGovern from South Dakota for the presidency, and he chooses Senator Thomas Eagleton of Missouri as his running mate. So the Democrats countered with Senator George McGovern for the presidency and Senator Thomas Eagleton of Missouri as his running mate. Now, the Democrats were sunk from the start because it was soon revealed, and this was a typical Richard Nixon deal, and we'll talk more about him later. He was the first mudslinger of all times. Everything, he was the guy that would do anything to win, Nixon. Well, it was soon revealed during the campaign that Thomas Eagleton had once been hospitalized for an emotional illness. Somebody dug that up. The vice presidential candidate Thomas Eagleton, who was running with George McGovern, had once been hospitalized for a mental or emotional illness. Well, you know what the diagnosis was? What was he suffering from? Pretty common. Now, now, in those days, depression, yeah, he was just, he was suffering from depression. But I'll tell you, it caused such a stink and such a controversy that McGovern was forced to ask Eagleton to step down, and he had to renominate another person to run for him. Part of the Kennedy family, anybody want to guess who it was? Part of the Kennedy family is going to run for vice president in 1972. What? No, not without a Kennedy name, but he's related. What? That's a good guess. That would have been interesting. <laughs> Sergeant Shriver. Sergeant Shriver, John Kennedy's brother-in-law, will end up being the vice presidential candidate. So this illness of a, and a diagnosis of depression led McGovern to ask Eagleton to step down. And when Eagleton agreed, McGovern chose Sergeant Shriver for the vice presidency. Guess who else had his eyes on the presidency again? as an independent, George Wallace. So he announces his candidacy, but he's going to be forced to withdraw quickly afterwards. So McGovern is going to represent the Democrats, Nixon, the Republicans, and old George Wallace is going to take the American Independent Party, and he announces he's going to run too, but he soon withdraws. Anybody know why? That's right. On May 16, 1972, May 16, 1972, Governor Wallace was shot and seriously wounded by an assassin by the name of Arthur Bremer while Wallace was campaigning in Maryland. So on May 16, 1972, while campaigning in Maryland, Governor Wallace was shot and seriously wounded by a would-be assassin by the name of Arthur Bremer. So on May 16, 1972, while campaigning in Maryland for the presidency, Governor Wallace was shot and seriously wounded by a would-be assassin by the name of Arthur Bremer. Uh, he was shot several times. He was shot in the stomach, he was shot in the shoulders, the arms, and he actually was shot in the spine, which was the bad one. So he was shot in the stomach, he was shot in his shoulders and arms, and also a bullet in his spine, which, may, which meant that he would be confined to a wheelchair for the remainder of his life. So he obviously withdraws from the race at that point. So McGovern is shot in the stomach, shoulders, arms, and in the spine during the attack, which forces him to be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So it's basically going to be McGovern for the Democrats, Nixon for the Republicans. Now, McGovern campaigned like crazy. He put out a hell of an effort, and he, and he campaigned on the following three issues. The following three issues. This is what he criticized the Nixon administration for. Anybody want to guess what some of them might be? Same old one we've had for a while. How he handled? Vietnam. Vietnam. So the Vietnam War was something that McGovern campaigned on. 
against Nixon. He also hit for the first time, it's going to be a big issue in the years to come, inflation. He hit Nixon for inflation. We're starting to have an inflation issue in our country, and he blamed Nixon for it. That's when prices inflate and wages go down. Prices go up, wages go down. That's inflation. And he also hit him on another pretty common theme we've talked about throughout this class. That Nixon wasn't very proactive in civil rights. Very good. So McGovern campaigned tirelessly, and he covered the following issues during the campaign. Nixon's lack of effort on the Vietnam War, Nixon's lack of effort in solving the inflation problem, and Nixon's indifference to civil rights. Okay, that's what McGovern hammered on. Well, this was never close. Nixon had three big reasons why he was confident of victory. He, he, he really was confident he was going to win, and he should be. And these are the three reasons why he was confident that he would win this election easily. First one had to do with George Wallace. Who's gonna, who, was, who was set to lose votes if George Wallace ran? Nixon. So he believed he could count on about 12 million to 15 million votes that probably would have gone to Wallace, which will now go to him. So that's one reason why he was confident in victory, is he was assured that 12 to 15 million votes that probably would have gone for Wallace will go to him. Another reason that he was confident in victory is he, did he or did he not reduce America's military role in Vietnam? Absolutely. He can't, you know, he, he made that a point. Hey, I told you I'd bring an honorable end to the Vietnam War. And I am doing so because it wasn't over quite yet. 72, it's pretty close, okay? So he hadn't solved the problem, but he sharply reduced America's military role because he was bringing soldiers home, fighting only on the defensive, less American lives lost. And the third thing he did is he improved relations with two communist countries that we were struggling with. And he really did do this. He really did do a good job of improving relations with these two countries. What are they? Soviet Union and China. Very good. So he campaigns little. He's confident of victory for three reasons. He believes he can count on the 12 to 15 million votes that would have gone to Wallace if he had stayed in the race. He sharply reduced America's military role in Vietnam, and he had improved relations with two serious communist countries, China and the Soviet Union. But he was a paranoid guy. Nixon was a paranoid guy. And even though there was no question that he was going to win this election, he told his aides and his staff to do whatever it takes to ensure I'm reelected. Do whatever it takes. I told him that. Well, there, you're going to find out that they're going to take this a little too far. So he informed his aides and his staff to do whatever it took, take whatever steps necessary to make sure that I get reelected. Because he was a little paranoid. Didn't need to be. When the smoke cleared after election day, Nixon won one of the greatest victories in American history for the presidency. He captured 60% of the popular vote. That's pretty big. Anytime you get 60 or better, it's a pretty good butt kicking. So you captured 60% of the popular vote. Of the 538 electoral votes possible, of the 538 possible, McGovern got 17. Out of 538 possible electoral votes, McGovern gets just 17, which means Nixon got 521. I mean, that is a butt kicking in, a, in an election. Holy smokes. 521 to 17. That is a major crushing. He captured 49 of the 50 states. 49 of the 50 states. McGovern won only one state. Which one was it? You'd think so, but he didn't even win South Dakota. He won the Kennedy state, which was Massachusetts. That's the only 17 votes, electoral votes he got. He even lost his own state. But he did win Massachusetts, which gave him his 17 electoral votes. Problem, what's the problem for Nixon, even though he's re-election? What's his problem? He still has what type of Congress? Democratic-controlled Congress. So he still is going to face that problem. So... Even though Nixon wins a massive decision over McGovern, in which McGovern doesn't even win his own state, 
The Democrats are going to continue to control both houses of Congress, both the Senate and the House. Okay, kids, that's going to take us to the old Watergate scam. And what I did is I've broken this up to the beginnings the trial, etc. So we're going to talk about the Watergate scandal, but we're going to talk about the beginnings. How does this thing start? How many of you have heard of Watergate? How many heard of the Watergate scandals? What do you know about it? What happened? Like, like, happened to do something to find out the truth. Like, it happened to explain. But it is kind of hard to explain, and I'll do that, but you're right. Yeah. Didn't they, like, record information to a private meeting? Oh. All Nixon told his aides to do whatever possible to get him elected. You wouldn't believe the stuff they did. It's just, they didn't need to. It's the thing that really is amazing. We'll tell you about the beginnings. How did this thing ever start? Very early in the morning on June 17, 1972. Very early in the morning on June 17, 1972. A security guard at the Watergate apartment complex noticed something a little bit odd. A security guard at the Watergate apartment complex noticed something odd. Now, when we were walking across the Potomac River Bridge, you remember that? And I pointed over and I said, there's the Watergate apartment buildings, those round apartments. That's what we're talking about. And what do those apartments have in them? They had people that were living there, but what else did they have? Offices, okay? Offices. And what happened early in the morning of June 17, 1972, is the security guard noticed something off. And his name was Frank Wills. Frank Wills.